Okay, so um, hello everyone again. Um, so this uh, conversation is uh, entitled Building Creative Spaces Around Existing Communities. Um, I'm going to let the panel uh, introduce themselves. Um, so just quick um, name and introduction about who you are and what you do. Um, so yeah, Dr. Mina Fombo, I uh, founder and director of Black Girl Convention. So we work with 150 women and girls, 14 to sort of 75, all areas of um, yeah, workshops, coaching, leadership, tech, digital, media, hair, and the rest of it. Um, I also um, am a, I'm a creative. I also manage a program over at Norwest Media Center for a full service creative agency. So supporting emerging talent, work in the sector from web design and development to film to photography and everything else in between. Brilliant, thanks. Uh, Georgina? Hello, is this on? Yeah, okay. Um, I'm George Bolton. Um, I've got a couple of hats on. Um, I am the Bristol City Council Public Art Officer. Uh, and I'm not speaking with that house on in this panel, but I just really wanted to acknowledge um, how important it was to listen to all those things in the previous panel and the kind of urgency and complexity of those issues. Um, and that we are really trying to answer such a complex question, which is kind of how to, how to create a bold, resilient, relevant way of procuring public art provision or cultural provision through the planning process at the moment. Um, that conversation is going on. Um, uh, we're wanting everyone to be a part of it, but thank you for being patient with us. It's a, it's a very complex issue, but one that's incredibly urgent. Um, but in this panel, um, I've got a hat on of a very proud member of uh, uh, the Board of Trustees for an organization called Terrestrial, um, who are a producers and commissioners of wild adventures and art projects working out of the southwest of England. Currently have been doing um, an ambitious program of works in Western Supermare over the past year, uh, where we um, kind of, well, we definitely trust in artists to be kind of leaders and explorers and and partner them with local community organizations who potentially have had uh, limited access and experience um, in the arts and working with artists. Um, and importantly, kind of uh, trust in them and those partnerships to go on a journey together that's, that's based on process, exploring, um, less on outcome, and really thinking about how an artist can work with communities to th see things differently, potentially share the stories of their place. So I'll be, I'll be kind of speaking with that hat on Thank today. Thank you. Uh, Jill? Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Jill Simmons, and I'm the artistic director of a theatre and community arts company called Brave Bold Drama, which everyone gets wrong, and I really wish I'd thought of a better name. Um, and Brave Bold Drama lives in a community arts centre called Creative Workspace that's in Withywood, which we lease and run as rehearsal and creative space for the creatives of this city and also program events for every type of human from very, very small um, up to... Uh, not so small and um, who've been here a while and um, yeah we have a little community cafe and um, we're plugging away uh, uh, connecting primarily with the communities of Hartcliffe and Withywood who are demographically and statistically some of the most deprived culturally deprived and every kind of deprived in the city so that's why I'm here I'm very happy to be thanks. here thank you thanks Joe. Jess um, hi I'm Jess Wright and I run Zion Community Space uh, which is based in BS13 in Bedminster Down. Uh, we kind of exist to keep the building going. Interestingly, going back to the last panel discussion, I actually bought the building from the church with a large loan from Triodos Bank. Um, but that means that I didn't have to go, I um, certainly had to deal with enough planning permission and issues with all kinds of departments, but um, I'm happy to chat to anybody about the process I took afterwards. Um, so we're a not-for-profit uh, social enterprise and we're non-funded so we have to survive through the cafe and through the events we do which is about two to three hundred a year alongside a daytime cafe and the main aim is to keep the building going within that community really and to offer it to everybody. That's it. Stephen? Hi I'm, I'm Stephen uh, and I'm uh, um, an academic, a community artist, a writer, filmmaker and um, an, ac uh, an activist Brilliant, thank you. Okay, so I just want to open it up with a question really about the title of this um, talk that I found a little bit problematic and it was really with the use of the word around. I think that might be part of the problem that we're talking about building arts 
institutions around existing communities. And I wanted to bring Mina in first in terms of what your experience is of working with communities and how we can kind of maybe counter some of that. Um, what's the question? So, um, d is part of the problem that we're, we're doing to rather than with, and is there a better way of doing it? Um, I think, yeah, first of all, yeah, doing to rather than with. So, I think in, in both my hats, as Black Girl Convention, um, we spent sort of three years just grafting as a team behind the scenes, just pulling together this amazing network of women that are doing things. The amount of emails I have in my inbox from large institutions constantly saying, can we come and do this? Can we come and do that? Rather than... Um, I guess, enabling or allowing us to do with our community, if that makes sense, is one of the challenges. In my sort of Norwest Media Centre hat, I find that um, we work with a lot of artists, so we have a young people's programme, and again, my inbox is full of people saying, oh, I've got an Arts Council grant, or I've got some funding, or I've got this, I want to come and do art with young people. And I think my, my thoughts around that are, one is, well, what qualifies you, first of all, to work with a young person? Um, have you done any training? You know, if that young person is creating a piece of art and share some feelings around self-harm, how are you going to deal with that? So first of all, just because someone's an artist and they want to come and work with a community of young people, they assume that they're qualified just because they like to create art. But then secondly, with, I guess, uh, in Nor West, it's one of the most sort of deprived, um, I guess, economic areas in the country. Um, there's a number of sort of issues going on there, but also there's some amazing things happening. And again, I think the challenge is around people saying, oh, I want to come and work in this community. I think there's something around, um, it's a privilege for some people to call themselves an artist. There are lots of people that are making films, that are making music, that are illustrators, that are creating alongside their, their day jobs. They may not call themselves an artist. So I guess within communities like that, it's around, I guess the question being, yeah, something around... Um, the idea of an artist coming in to do something with a community rather than saying, well, there's already artists within this community. Mm -hmm. Is there a space for them to just create more, if that makes sense? More space to just create yeah. freely. So I think, yeah, the short answer is, um, it's about balance. Nice, thanks. Uh, Stephen, I just wanted to quick, quickly bring you in on this one because one of the previous panels where we talked a lot about gentrification and this, again, this idea about the arts is sometimes, you know, and the artists specifically seen as the kind of problem rather than kind of a victim of that gentrification. And I guess, you know, if creative spaces, if we're getting it wrong, you know, what are we getting wrong and what can we do better from your experience? Um, Could you just speak into the microphone as well? Because thanks. Um, yeah. Um, Creative spaces. I think picking up on the. I think the problem is that there's there's a there's a culture of uh, doing too that exists exists within our, every element of our society today and has done for a very very long time, and that is um, a one w in which working class people people um, from B E M E cultures dis disabled people is people fr who are in some way others and othered by the system. Have all we, the, there's a there's a sort of uh, missionary zeal around middle class people in this country to to try and and go into these communities almost like colon, colonize, colonizers and sort of do to them because we know what's best for you and 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 we know what you need um, and I think that you just need to look at uh, cultural policy um, as a classic example for that. The arts and culture are highly instrumentalised at every level, um, primarily as a result of new labour, um, and that's been continued by coalition and conservative governments. So when it comes, and, and alongside that is this idea of uh, creative spaces, creative cities, the creative class, and these, these are literally a, a certain type of people, primarily white, middle class, able-bodied people who are, are seen as being able to go into an area and somehow make these magical changes and make, as someone said before, make things better. And I think that we need to understand, right, that it's not our job to make things better. Who do we think we are? Nice, thank you. Um, okay, so off the, off the back of that, um, so why, why are creatives, why are we having this conversation about creative spaces then in communities? Why are they important? Why do we feel that they're so compelled to have creative cultural spaces within communities? Um, Georgina? Yeah, um, stemming, yeah, answering that question and also on the back of the previous one, um, I guess what, what, what's, I find really 
exciting and special about Terrestrial's model, and I'm speaking on behalf of the organisation, obviously, and, and Tom Spencer, who's the brilliant director. Um, but the actual the model of that, um, of the organisation, was... And, uh, what am I trying to say? Is that it's based on... Um, on process, so we've had brilliant funding from the Arts Council and the Jerwood to uh, go in and explore, kind of, you know, not not put, not kind of uh, assume what a place needs, but actually before the organisation even formed, before the model developed, there were two years of kind of research embedded within the community of Western to say, actually, we're here to listen. What, what do you need and what maybe is missing? And I think it's, it's very similar to Bristol. You know, it's not saying, oh, oh, poor you, you've got no creative people. You know, there's nothing going on. It's, what, what, what a shame. It's like, wow, look at all these incredible things that are going on and the people that are there. And they maybe don't have a space to gather to share that, to push that stuff to the next level or to collaborate or to see what's possible. And I think that really came back and that was one thing that um, the model, because it's the first place that Terrestrial has worked in, really left space to explore and support. Um, there are four major projects that are going on um, this year through Terrestrial where artists have been embedded into community organisations such as um, Ad Action, who are a kind of national uh, charity to support those with, with drug addiction, um, a community that works with older isolated people, um, a kind of uh, education system called the Extend Network, which supports 500 um, children across seven primary schools. But what there wasn't space for in this initial idea is, is this idea that they'd support a whole new community arts centre to take place and to, to shape and form and be secured in the centre of the high street. Um, and the space for that programme to say, right, we've listened this is what you actually need. We're going to change tact. We're going to put some money into that. You know, we're going to support this space, this platform for people to come together. Um, and the results have been absolutely astounding. And that's not down to the organisation. That's down to the people that were already there in that place. You know, have a space to gather. Brilliant. Um, Jill and Jess, just uh, any other thoughts around that in terms of, you know, again, people who are kind of involved in, you know, managing spaces, kind of being the kind of enabler potentially for the art to happen as opposed to maybe somebody who's sort of top-down programming. I just wondered if you had any other thoughts around that in terms of what you see as the kind of real benefit for your communities. What do you see really playing out on a kind of day-to-day -day basis? Um, okay, so, yeah, I probably, I'm, I fit a lot of those things. I'm... I'm white and I'm able-bodied and I probably sound quite middle class. I've got a master's degree, but I do live in Withy Woods. I am a single parent and I exist on benefits. So um, I feel that I am giving and enriching the space that I'm literally tied to most of the time. There are two kids out there who, if they shout and scream, I will have to just dash out and sort that out. Um, so I feel that um, because I'm trapped in a certain pace of Bristol that I'm trying to make it... Um, I am trying to make it better for people. I don't uh, assume any... I have privilege and I recognise that, but... Um, there is very little for Hartcliffe and Withywood to do. There are these, you know, there is quite a bleakness of just a lack of, of space, um, of a safe space for people to come. We know that, you know, the impact of, of the arts of being creative. I think what we try and do is our bottom line is if we are open, there is an artist in the building and you are allowed to be creative if you wish. Um, and I think that that offer of come and be creative yourself um, and enabling that is, is a really important um, balance to keep so that you don't just become, oh, you know, I, I watch lots of nice theatre and then I programme something and I sell that to you. Um, there is always, if you've come to kind of consume uh, the product of a professional artist in our building, there is then a workshop, an opportunity to engage, to explore your own and to give status to that. Hanging on our walls at the moment in glass frames is the painting of a five-year-old, you know, and it says it's an elephant in a party hat, but it's hung as if it was curated at the Tate Modern. And um, she comes back and she's super proud of that. So um, it's... But if... If you are in a really, really bleak place um, and you don't have kind of the agency or you feel that your life is so chaotic that you, you don't feel you can go and access um, opportunities in other parts of town, there's, there's a lot of geographical barriers right on the edge of the city that prevent um, families from where I'm based from actually accessing any other free opportunities. I feel like, well, we're here on your doorstep and here is a film and then some stuff you can do or here is an opportunity to do this. And it's something you can actually physically get to. Um, and then you can grow yourself through your creativity. Um, I think that is 
although I am, you know, I have that privilege, I feel that um, what I'm giving to the community is, I hope, not a patronising offer, but Thanks. an enriching offer. Thanks, Jill. Um, Jess, just because also you, also you mentioned at the beginning your model for delivery is slightly different. You're not publicly funded. You purchase the building yourself. Um, obviously, a lot of kind of push around space kind of hangs off the back of what Arts Council say and do or other kind of big funders. Um, and... Um, you know, I wonder what you see, because obviously there's a big kind of agenda around creative case for diversity and the role that community art centres can play in terms of what is seen as diversifying audience, but then that kind of gets back to that model of being a consumer and somebody who just in the end will purchase art. I wonder if you, what are your thoughts on that in terms of somebody who just is just kind of outside of that model? Do you want to get in it or do you just want to keep doing something different? Uh, I want to probably stay out of that model, I think. Um I suppose what was important, as we're not funded, I mean, when I opened, there was a hell of a lot of suspicion from at least half the community, which was, why the hell do we want an art space? Um, and the other half came in saying, this is brilliant. Um, but the fact is, we're not funded, so we're not going to survive unless people come through the door. And, and that's the be-all and end-all, really. Unless we programme stuff that people want to come to, we won't survive because we need them to come in, buy tea, buy tickets to events. Um, so it's not an easy thing. It's taken a very long time, but I have to, you know, we're on the front line. We're in the cafe every day. People are not shy at coming in and telling me if they think something's shite. So, um, <laughs> but what I would say is on the flip side of that, sometimes people don't know what they want. <laughs> so, yeah. and I'm quite stubborn. Um, so, you know, tomorrow night we've got a show about the ancestry and the social history of Zimbabwe. Now, possibly the residents of BS13 wouldn't know they wanted to come and see that show, but it's pretty much sold out. So I think that's how we've come forward in eight years, from them sort of tentatively coming to quiz nights to learning to trust the space, to then come into a show like tomorrow night. So, But it has to be about them, otherwise we wouldn't survive, so... Thanks. Um, I guess sort of part of this as well kind of hinges on this kind of idea of like there's kind of high art and there's the art that people want to kind of pay for and then there's like the community art and that's kind of seen as like the bit that we kind of do because it's a bit nice and but you know we don't really want to kind of you know throw maybe money at that unless there's kind of a, a real reason. I just wonder if any of you guys have got any thoughts around you know advocating in a different way for community arts or rebranding community arts or do you think it's all fine as it is? Um, I think for me, there's, the first thing I say is if two people say it's art, then it's art, right? That's the old saying. Um, I think the second thing is it's more about rebranding the word community. I think it's not about... By, because the word community has such connotations in just depending on where it's used, how it's used, that is actually the, the deciding factor as to, to with the word the art following it. So I think it's about people re re recognising and valuing that community-led business or community-led arts or community-led learning and development or whatever has an equal value as a corporate level something or, ha or as an arts institution level something. Everything is about balance. Um, just going back to the question you asked earlier there around uh, about creative spaces being needed, I was just going to add, for me, like, you know, we live in the world, we're human beings, so creative spaces are needed within communities as much as sports spaces are needed within communities, as much as spaces are to go and learn something, as much as spaces are to go and connect and to interact, mm -hmm. do you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. With other people, outside spaces, I think it, it all, it's all part of the whole to build you know, stronger, stronger communities. 100%. Um, I, I recognize that, I mean, we've not been open as long. I also should say we're a community interest company, so we're a not-for-profit too. We've only been open since 2017, so we're a lot younger than, than Zion. But there is also, um, there's a real character around um, our way called Vic Eccleston, who, if any of you know, he's uh, quite, a, quite an interesting, you have to have quite a while if you meet him, um, but he's lovely. And he says, um, if people have only ever eaten baked beans, they'll just ask for baked beans. Um, and he says that a lot, pretty much every time I meet him. Um, but, and I, it makes it, uh, it sticks with me though, there is an element of, of bravery to exploring things, um, that if you are from a place where you don't feel like you've got a lot of confidence and things uh, you're aware of, you, you stick to what you know. Um, and I feel like part of our, our, our role to help people grow is to say, okay, come and watch a film, but then, so a, a young lad that sticks in my mind, he came initially to just watch a film that he already knew, so it was a really, really safe initial thing. Um, eventually he came in and he, he was um, doing a day of European clowning quite happily. Um, so 
there is this sense of once they trust, I re really chimes with me what Jess said about once um, a community trusts our space that they know um, they will have a good time when they come here. And um, I don't feel like, even though obviously European clowning compared to like watching the Lego movie, like you could, you could scale those on cultural value if you wanted. Um, I feel it's just about variety. I feel like it's about horizon broadening. Um, and rather than saying, oh, this will be, you know, this is better for you than watching a film. It's just about variety so that you're not always, you're not always watching the Lego movie and having baked beans. Sometimes you have found yourself the confidence to open out and, and that is why we also program, you know, slightly more exploratory things for people to enjoy and, and um, that's a really important thing. It's a horizon broadening rather than a this is better or worse thing. I, I want to just touch on that thing about um, exploring. Um, I, I'll just come back to you um, really quickly but I just want to touch on that as the, the kind of subsequent question is that um, how do you kind of balance in that kind of multicultural kind of you know inclusive setting that you're all trying to build um, how do you balance that where actually people's kind of sensitivities are going to be really different and actually taking that risk on programming certain things could actually have like you know actually you know potentially um, offend or kind of trigger somebody else um, how do you kind of balance that you know freedom of expression of the art alongside that very kind of you know um, mixed environment where actually people's opinions aren't going to be kind of homogenous people are going to receive things in really different ways um, but but do you just want to make a point on that last yeah, thing first? Got the, there's um, quite I guess quite a good example of that um, the terrestrials idea of artists as explorers and that thing about expanding horizons um, potentially went into Western with quite a, a challenging predicament as well it was the again not wanting to undermine any of the creativity and artists that were there but actually to acknowledge that bringing in other national artists and artists from other areas could shift that journey or inspire that journey or enable that growth in a way. And that was a really difficult conversation to have with a place that was, was very proud um, and, and uh, I hadn't yet been on a journey like that before. Um, so placing an artist uh, like Claire Reynolds, who's an in incredible dance choreographer, runs a, a, a company called Restoked, um, with other dance artists from Bristol and Western into an organization like Ad Action, which are the local drug addiction charity. Um, a really interesting model in terms of having to be really responsive, really gentle, really kind, um, think about a kind of duty of care to both artists and those people that were turning up every day. Um, it could be that we had five to 10 people um, who, who had, had a really good week. It could be that, that there were there was one, uh, that there was two, you know, so we were shaping and developing a project uh, in, a, in a rhythm that was kind of unpredictable and out of our control. Um, but what really did happen is that I think it's that open invitation and that generosity. It's putting those artists, creative thinkers and community, like you said, what is that definition? I mean, everyone, everyone is that. This, this project is about collaboration and growing those ideas together and um, genuinely sharing something and figuring that out along the way. Um, and I think that's where the success kind of came from um, in that particular project. Does anyone have any other thoughts about that in terms of just balancing freedom of expression within a kind of, and also trying to build an inclusive space where sometimes the two might not align because people are different? Yeah, I mean, we did have quite a, a lot of experience in our community. We've got really high hate crime rates. Um, so it was something that, you know, we had to open, we had to get the doors open, we had to get people in, we had to make people feel comfortable enough to come in the door before I felt that we could start challenging the other issues in the area. Some of them you have to challenge straight away. There might be road issues, there might be crime, there might be stuff that comes into the centre whether you like it or not. And we spend a lot of the time talking to various council departments, um, fire brigade, etc. But when we felt comfortable enough that I wanted to challenge the hate crime rates because, you know, I've had homophobic comments from the neighbours, but you have, it had to be done sensitively because I'm not there to highlight people even more in the community. So we did start um, a five year programme and it was called Diversity. It was a, a, a month, a month programme looking at different cultures um, and nobody's very comfortable using the word diversity, but we had to start somewhere. After four years, we decided that that's what our programme was continuously anyway, so we could sort of drop that as a special programme. Um, but then I guess it is about taking risk and making people feel comfortable. Mm -hmm. And if it's just about putting people in the programme, highlighting different cultures, <coughs> different ways of living, we had the first 
LGBT disco in the area, not knowing if there's anybody gay in the area. Turns out there are. So, um, but, you know, you've got to start somewhere and you've got to do something, I guess. Stephen, did you have anything you wanted to add to that or any thoughts so uh, far from the panel? Yeah, I guess just around uh, this idea of going into places and, and risk, uh, taking risks. And for me, um, I'm interested in... Uh, in, in, a grass, in a grassroots approach to thinking about culture, cultures on the, is a, as a plural, an understanding that our understanding of art and culture is extremely narrow and extremely exclusive, and to try and include something in an exclusive, narrow um, view of art, what art, culture, creativity, what you want, whatever you want to call it is, is the wrong place for me personally to start from. And I don't see that I take any risks at all in my practice. I think institutions see risk which is not there. And that is because they, decide, they are making decisions about what is and isn't risky, not the people. Mm -hmm. And I'm interested in cultural democracy. And my, work, my, my approach is to, is to work with people to... In, in a very privileged way, in a wrong way, I shouldn't be needed. I end up in roles where I'm fighting for people to be able to do the cultural activities they want to do without any intervention at all. And I am funded by Arts Council England and Heritage Lottery and local councils and all the rest of them. But my starting point is, you want to do this project, you listen to the people and you do what they want without any censorship or any involvement whatsoever, because it's only by engaging and working in that way that you can begin to, to, tr to show people that you, the funders, the councils, the, the authorities, trust them to make their decisions about what they need in their lives, rather than us trying... And it, yes, it's important to, as, alongside that to, to, to show people all different forms of arts and culture as well, but you must, you must begin, because let's face it, the, communi the, the community centres have gone, right? The libraries have gone, right? All, where I live, all the jazz bands have gone. All the cultural activities at working class levels have all gone. And instead, in our community, we've got a massive art centre that reaches out, right? Well, I'm sorry, that isn't good enough. And people don't respond to being reached. Some will, but it's what? Oh, I've worked with 30 school kids. Great, right? There's thousands of kids living in that area. Not good enough. We need to change the system radically. I think just you to were kind clicking of, on that, I was going to say, come on, Mina. Yeah, no, I was just going to add on to that and just say, like, um, I think in my North Media Centre, obviously, one of the things we talk about is starting with people. And so the idea is, especially on the young people, across all the programmes, but I obviously manage the young people's programme, it's very much focused on, yes, there are things that they won't know. So we obviously have a framework, but then within that framework, which is our theory of change, so all, we believe all young people are creative, um, they have to have a powerful experience, they have to develop skills, digital arts, tech, Base. They have to widen their network, both with their peers and get connected to the wider city. But ultimately, it's about their self-confidence. So within that framework, every program hinges on that. So if a young person um, wants to do a project, like for us, it's about you know just listening to their needs, listening to their wants, their aspirations, and also sharing along that same uh, path. I think the thing I was going to pick up on over here is when you're just talking about, um, damn it, I've just lost it. The idea that they say talking about starting with people, and then you said something about. Um, it has to come from the people, or? culture, democracy. Yeah, you talked about risk. Mm -hmm. I think um, with, uh, with Black Girl Convention Hat, everything is about being values-led. And so for me, I don't feel like I take any risks. I know, my, I know black women very well. I, I am one. I have lots of friends that are them. And so when we're creating a project, I don't need to think about it. I don't need to worry about it. For me, it's like we're queer affirming, we're inclusive. If you, uh, we, we're, you know, try, we don't hire buildings or use venues that aren't uh, fully accessible. Um, you know, we have fair pricing. We do all of that stuff, and that's that's our starting point. Um, and it doesn't it doesn't hinder us. And I think the last thing I'll just say, just around you talked about people being safe in the space. For me, it's about relationships. So whether that's your, your relationship with the space that you're engaging in or the relationship with the people or that, are, that are running it. So for me, Black Girl Convention doesn't have a building, but they know the brand, they know who we are, and they trust what we do. So anywhere we go, our audience will follow because of what we're offering. And so I think there's something in there that's really powerful just around, um, you know, yeah, if you're from within, then you've almost got an in already. Full stop, new paragraph. If you're from within, 
that has to be authentic and values led. And I think one of the challenges, especially within the, I'd see in the black community in Bristol is that there are people that talk about representing the black community and the white community think they do, so they trust them, but actually they're not starting with people. So therefore it's not, uh, it's not on balance. Brilliant, thanks. So, okay, so let's just bring it back to Bristol at the moment and uh, uh, the title again, Building Creative Spaces Around Existing Communities, with, with existing communities. Building creative spaces with communities or letting communities build creative spaces. Um, what are we doing right as, like, in Bristol at the moment? And, like, you guys have all given some really great examples. Is there anything else that we can pull out that are really good examples that are kind of, we feel that are working and what really is just not working? What are the kind of major flaws in our, you know, kinks in our armour or the risks on the horizon that are messing things up for everyone? Oh, I, I just, are we talking about Bristol or can I talk about Western? Well, okay, like Southwest, yeah. Southwest. Sure. Um, one of the key things about the, the Western art space, which is, which is this community created space that um, has arisen out of, out of Part, aligned with the terrestrials program, it's important to say that it's definitely led by the people. There is now a, a membership of a hundred artists that use that space freely. It's an open invitation to sing, dance, create, get messy, make noise. Um, really, kind of, I think language. I think we've all touched upon that. Is a, and that invitation is a really, really important thing. And that was something that, um, especially in Western, we learned terrestrial learn in those research years. Um, that all the yeah, it's it's kind of it's completely opened up the way that space is being used. Um, the, it, it's worth noting that, that leadership and local leadership and politics had a big part to pay in it. Um, Terrestrial had a difficult job of securing this space um, from uh, a conservative local government before this May when it changed to Labour. Um, and it was a peppercorn rent agreement. It's still worth saying it's, it's, un, it's unsecure and the future is, is undefined at this stage. But one of the amazing things that happened is that this group of people um, really new into, the, into this space wanted to already think about the legacy and the future and put in an application to East Street Arts Guild Fund through that, you know, want the, the deadline, you know, needed to create a name for themselves, kind of got together and, and formed themselves as this amazing group. Unfortunately, they weren't successful in getting that, but the repercussions of having that deadline and that invitation has been really incredible. Um, that case study for that place and in line with the change of local government to a, to a Labour government who, who are really open and listening much more than the previous one um, has meant that it can act as a really strong case study and there's already invitations to that community and others to open up other spaces in, in the, the high street that's all being boarded up at the moment and the shopping centre's in uh, disrepair and there's about 20 empty units and there's conversations about what's going to happen there. It's not long term, but it is it, it has had a kind of catalytic effect. Um, so yeah, just wanted to kind of mention mention that. So, so, is there anything that we feel that you know good examples of community-led practice in Bristol, um, or where, or you know, you know, on the flip side of that, where are we really just not getting it right, and you know, what are we messing up? I think that from personal experience, it's every time I come into uh, any kind of contact with officialdom, and whatever level that is, whether it's local government, councils, councillors, slightly better. I, you know, I know how hard we all work. I certainly know how hard Jill works at Creative Workspace because we're in a similar environment and paying insurance, uh, running costs of a centre, all of that takes up so much time. And I think there is more out there that could be done to help if we're already trying to get the job done then maybe just help us, not keep stopping us from trying to do the job by taking up our time with stuff that really isn't that important or could just be helped a little bit mm -hmm. to move along a bit quicker. So that's just my... I think that's the one thing that Bristol does get wrong. It's, um, it's almost like stamping down on any creative practice with mm. stuff that really is insignificant to what we're trying to do in the long run and we're actually helping the city. So yeah, I think someone said help. yesterday about things happening in spite of, not because of the city sometimes. Um, uh, has anyone else got any thoughts just, about what might need to change? Or I don't want to argue. Go for it. I just wanted to say in Bristol, um, kind of slightly speaking with my other hat on as well, I think it's, and, and in light of what happened, you know, the conversations in the other panel, um, it's really it's really important to listen, isn't it? To really listen in, and, and to listen to, to what people need 
in those different areas of the city as well and not make assumptions. And, and potentially in Bristol, you know, we're in this critical, urgent situation that everyone's aware of, the, the lack of cultural workspace. And, you know, we need to be supporting that, that cultural arts ecology. And sometimes that's not through commissioning new works to happen. It's going three steps backwards and saying, how do we retain those creative practitioners and artists and give them the space they need mm. to be able to commission people to make the work? So, yeah, I think... It's a provocation just, more than I'm just going to slightly flip this question a little bit. So, um, so if we're talking about, we're trying to speak our collective truth to power, but we're representing lots of different voices with lots of different interests, how do we speak with one voice? And what are we going to say? Mina. <laughs> no pressure. Say, say that again. Collective. So how do we speak our truth to power? and make the change that we want to see happen, bearing in mind there's a lot of different voices saying a lot of different things. Okay, I can only talk from experience. So where I got to is um, similar to the, sorry, I've, I've, I'm not sure your name done yet, but the Zion Project. When I set up Black Girl Convention, I was in very much in a space of, I don't want government money, I'm not going to get a loan, I'm not going to do this, I'm going to run my own business as a consultancy and I will fund Black Girl Convention and that way it can be whatever we decide for it to be and it will serve the people in the way that I know will serve them, and that's it. And as soon as I made that declaration, literally people were ringing the phone and saying, oh, have some money, have some money, have some money. So I was in a really bit red space where I was like, well, do I take it or not? You know, and in the end I was like, this is ridiculous. If someone wants to give me a couple of grand for whatever, like, I'll just take the money. And so then um, I think what's kind of happened in terms of like, uh, how, how do you, uh, the question you've asked. I think for me, it's just by leading by example and just, just getting it done. So by, not by any means necessary, but I think um, we're in a very privileged space now where everybody wants to come and work with us and we just kind of say, yeah, this is what we do. If you want to give us money for it, there's not necessarily a return from you. The, the black girl events are for black women to come to only and I go to white people to get the money for it. Mm -hmm. So, um, and they're happy to give it at this, at this point. Um, we're in a space now where if we want to go for a large fund, we could do. I'm looking at a venue that's, I, that I might buy outright. I might take a loan and just buy whatever. So I think because we, we have an audience, um, we're just living by our values. We're making it happen and we're not prepared to be stopped. Um, and I think for me, the legacy of, of that whole movement, because it is a movement, is at, at the same time, how do we then support the infrastructure of the of the city for other people to not have to to fight so hard mm -hmm. to make, make that way forward because it can't just be like a lone soldier making mm -hmm. one thing successful mm -hmm. because when i collapse of exhaustion <laughs> the whole thing may crumble <laughs> yeah. and so it's trying to build that legacy on and so mm -hmm. for me working with a lot of young people again sharing all that knowledge sharing all that learning bringing other people through um and that's kind of how, that's how i'm doing it Thanks, me. That's great. Stephen, have you got any other thoughts in terms of your activist kind of work, in terms of how to build like a really, you know, clear, coherent narrative out of all this pluralism that we're talking about? Rather than just having like, you know, like, yeah. like Mina said as well, lone soldiers, maybe, you know, they're going to drive their project forward, but then there's a risk of burnout or that project, you know, losing its momentum after yeah. that person's kind of gone. So, so essentially, uh, we need, I, I, I believe that we need to think uh, as, it, as, as individuals and collectively, it's not either or, it's, it's, a, it's a, an and. And, and we need to, to, to come together at this point in time, this crucial point in time. People are voting now on something that's really going to affect all of us, everybody in this country, including arts and culture in terms of funding, right now. We, as a group, are incredibly disparate and I would put to you, if you think about the, the trajectory of artists and the role of artists within our society, where are we today? Where are we now? We are seen by the government and by large corporations as the perfect post-Fordist model workers. Flexible, no rights, individual, do several things at the same time, go anywhere, right? For very little money. We have no collective organization, and we need it. If we consider, in 1968, that the, the governments around the world considered art, at the, during the May protests and revolutions, considered artists to be some of the most dangerous people, leading and organizing government, um, communities across right, issues, across cultures, ac across class, to, to stand together, 
And today, we are the perfect neoliberal workers. What does that say about us? And what I believe is that until we all, we all have differences, and right now we've been working in terms of rebalancing cultural funding, and we're working inside the system. It has to be inside and outside, and outside and inside. It, it's not one or the other. We need a combined, concerted effort where collectively we stand together, and individually sometimes some take leadership and stand up, because right now, if I ask you, I would like to ask you as an artist, who sometimes feels like they need to self-censor in the presence of funders and other arts organisations. Who would, who would be willing, who feels that they sometimes may need to do that? I feel it every day in my life. Right. <laughs> I mean, not in my black girl so, kind of hat, no. So when, <laughs> but in my, in my so, day job, yes. In my day job, yeah. So well, we are being, our precarity is causing us to not just work, uh, to be individualised, but to fear speaking out. We have a democratic right. We must be able to speak out individually and collectively. Thanks, Stephen. Uh, questions from the floor. This is really inspirational stuff, guys, and I don't want to like, let that, this momentum go, but I just want to make sure we've got some time to get some questions on the floor because Mina's also got to go in about 10 minutes. So, um, oh, two hands very quickly at the back. Yep. Alice? <laughs> Thanks, Alice. Thanks for that point. Yeah, I'm going to ask um, Mina and Stephen. Um, Mina, I remember <coughs> sitting with you outside in the Northern West, and I was so inspired by what you were doing in terms of people <coughs> going and doing their own stuff, setting up their own organisation, setting up their own thing. You mentioned earlier, I think, about the kinds of the kinds of way they then generate income. Again, not being seen as part of the mainstream model. So I just wondered what advice and what do you, what do you think, the people that you work with, how do they go on and create their own economies so that they can sustain what they're doing and not maybe repeat the mistakes that we seem to be making? If I understand the question right, um, it's, it's in a multitude of ways. So I think part of the journey is deciding if you want to work for yourself, if you want to generate finance from your art, inverted commerce, whatever that might mean for you, or whether your art is something you do as your form of therapy, or whether it's a form of just pleasure, or whether it's a form of being part of a community and you earn your finance in another way. So I think part of the journey, especially for young people and emerging artists, is deciding, you know, do I want to have a stable income with regular holidays, with uh, secure this, that, and the other, and do, you know, do as I'm told in a, in, a, in a profession. If that's the life that they want, then they'll go and work, and they'll do that art on the side. If they're quite happy working freelance with no rights, do you know what I mean, with unsecure income, going anywhere, because they're a free spirit, and that works for them, and they don't need, you know, a regular sort of whatever, then, then we encourage them to do that and we'll help them set up as an entrepreneur and all the different ways that you can sell your practice, whether that is you know, sharing your skills, uh, becoming a facilitator and training in the thing that you also do um, as opposed to just doing it. So I think, if I understand the question right, for me it's just about enabling people to explore, it's about having, like I said, building confidence. So enabling people to have the confidence to make an informed choice about which path that they go down. And, and as part of that, in terms of like act, everyday activism and campaigning, um, because of the very stance of Norwest Media Center and Black Girl Khan is a form of activism in itself, is the idea that um, you, know, you, can, you can have the confidence to self-censor or to not self-censor, or to play the game, because that's gonna help you get ahead in the longer run, rather than just you know, saying what you feel and think at that exact moment in time. Um, I just want to make a quick announcement about, I have um, a mailing list there, if anybody wants to put their email address down to kind of exactly continue that conversation about how do we form collectives, how do we form collective action, put our voices together, lobbying, unions, um, yeah, so anyway, that's fine. Any questions? Anyone? Everyone sort of like holds back and then when I start talking again there'll be loads of questions coming off at the end. Um, Okay, so so we're gonna we're gonna sort of build these movements. We're gonna try and be individuals, but speak collectively. Um, 
if you could like, if today, if there was a takeaway, if there was decision makers in the room, they're going to take away one thing from today. What is the takeaway that you want those decision makers, the people who are kind of in charge of the, whether it be the land or the finances or just kind of just make, saying yes or no to something? What, what, what would you like them to do or not do? And I'll just, everyone, this is open to everyone. So, I think for me, there's that thing around um, work with me, like decolonizing the arts uh, structure. So ultimately, no matter what happens, the decision is made up here as to what qualifies as art, as to who gets the finance, as to the way you apply for that finance, as to the way to re you report on it, and so on and so forth. And um, that's also patriarchal as well. So I think there's something in there just around... Um, if the takeaway was that the system needs to be revamped so that more people have access to live this privileged life of um, either being a free spirit and choosing to not have any money and create work versus, um, not, that not, versus that not actually being a choice for you. Because I think it is a choice to choose to live that life. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I, I think, yeah, just following up from that, it would be kind of don't, don't, don't take things for granted to come to these things, to experience the power that some of those spaces can achieve. Um, and I think uh, time as well, giving time and realizing that these things take time and long form partnerships, um, thinking about value creatively and imaginatively, uh, really respecting um, and listening. I think that's one thing that we, we really need to take away. Um, oh, so many things. I'm coming at it from very, various different hats, but one thing that's that's really struck me is the especially with these kind of ways of working in a very long form embedded way it's like the, the power of those spaces and rooms it's kind of not 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 thinking that you know what that's doing but going to things experiencing talking to those people seeing the effects of that on people's lives um, some of the people that we've been working with in, in Western, for example, um, you know, success might look like that Ad Action Charity engaging with um, creative people and artists to do that again on an X program, or schools inviting artists and communities to work with them and their children, which would affect another 500, um, 500 school kids coming out of a different year, or, um, you know, all those, we're working with an amazing um, organisation called the, um, for, on a project called the Voices of Well, which is with a a community organization that works with isolated older people in a community. Um, and they didn't really know what could be possible. You know, the invitation to them was, you are the Steven Spielberg of your own lives. Let's make a film and celebrate you. So um, yeah, I think as showcasing these things, keep on doing it, being bold, um, being proud and kind of, yeah, bringing people together, I think. Thanks. Jill? Um, so I'm not sure who the kind of big hitters would be but for me um, like it or lump it what really really helps is um, partnership work um, like we are three people and um, we are right on the edge of the city but um, we met uh, we, we strategically kind of try and meet with bigger hitters so um, when I email Tom Morris at the Bristol Old Vic now he knows who I am he's been to our venue and he helps us out um, and it's it's a really quick process and I think what I'm trying to say is um, if you are kind of, it would really really help when you are um, beating your little drum in a really small bit of a, of a town like no one human can change the world but you are trying to just change the bit that you can reach and the people that you see every day um, but what really really helps when you are kind of trying to do that is is larger organizations and also just just advocating for you um saying we've worked with these people before these people are, are, are worth knowing because what happens in my bit of town a lot and i guess this is is there's a huge amount of changeover. Um, like, the school teachers can't hack it and leave really quickly. And I used to be a teacher, so there's absolutely no criticism there on, on teachers. It's just a fact that if you're in a really tough bit of town, uh, people stay for a bit and then go, oh, I need a break. And that happens with the PCSOs, and it happens. So there's this huge changeover of people. So we build up a network, and we try and connect and go, oh, PCSOs, tell us what the kids on the street are telling you about what they really like so that we can program that. And then they just evaporate and their emails never get turned off so you're just emailing into the void um, and I, what I guess I'm trying to say is um, people that do have more of an umbrella overview whoever those people would be um, have a sense of, of a map and a, and, a, and a real warm and connected um, attitude towards keeping in touch with all these little pockets of, of places that are trying to just be kind of 
shining like like little enriched places within communities so that we aren't I, I spend a huge amount of time just trying to reconnect um, because someone's moved on and the handover didn't happen and things die and then I'm like my fun I won't get more money because the numbers were down and then that funder will think there's no need for that and it's just because that email doesn't work anymore um, so um, but support from a high uh, level, whoever that would be, um, to to just s stop wasting our time so that we can carry on connecting so that people don't just miss out because they didn't know about something. Thank you. That would really help. <laughs> Jess, have you got anything? I've probably you already had my rant, but it's a bit <laughs> of a reiteration of that, is uh, for all the big names out there, uh, yeah, don't just use us because mm -hmm. uh, we've got a breastfeeding group, we've got a memories cafe, we've got an older people's workshop. Don't just use us because we're the ones that are in connection with our community. We're in connection with them because we work bloody hard mm -hmm. to do that. Mm -hmm. um, and then you just realise that, so you won't support <laughs> us, but you like to tap into the audience we have. So Ooh, maybe yeah. just be a little yeah, bit yeah, more exactly. supportive in the first place. Mm -hmm. Like one of those kind of like brain worms from Rick and Morty, just like, well, anyway. Um, yeah. Stephen, any sort of Jerry Springer style final thoughts from you? <laughs> um, so I think we need to, when we're thinking about building around existing communities, I think you need to consider what you mean by building and, I would th and we need to think about also what we mean by existing communities. And I think there's a lot of ideas around building and place and the use of space and place and buildings a little too much and space is about a lot more than just something concrete something abstract it is about relationships exist in space we do not need buildings in order for we do not arts and culture does not need buildings creativity and cultural expression does not necessarily need buildings so when we talk about building there are many ways we can build alliances and networks and, and new communities without the need for, for, for buildings. And, and, and in some ways that can, can free us from some of the issues that I've heard being talked about over and over again today around uh, insurance and all the rest of it. And, and maybe there's different ways in which we can think that, that thinks, really thinks outside the box. Thank you. Um, I think, is, are we on time or have we got time for another question? Is there one more question that anyone has a pressing, burning question? No. All right. I think that might be it. And I think we're on time, Mina. Uh, unless you've got anything else you want to add as well, because that just links back into what you were saying about I'll your group a, rather than, you know, your movement rather than a building. So I have a provocation, though, mm. which you can take off into the break as I yeah. run out the door. Thank you. I think um, I, I agree with what you said. Um, full stop, new paragraph. I think that buildings are not important if you come from a community that's always had buildings. I think as a member of the black community, we haven't had buildings, we mm -hmm. don't have buildings, we don't have ownership. And I think for us, we're in a very different space yeah. in this country, especially based on how Bristol has been, uh, mm -hmm. ha has been built off the back of the transatlantic mm -hmm. slave trade. Mm -hmm. So I think that there, is, uh, there are different needs for different communities mm -hmm. when it comes to arts and culture, mm -hmm. and maybe within white communities, working class or middle class or whatever, mm -hmm. the need to own stuff and spaces doesn't necessarily mm -hmm. have its same place mm -hmm. in the black community. Uh, and I say black as in African Caribbean black. Mm -hmm. It's very important for us to actually have economic power by having physical mm. spaces in the city. So for us, we're in mm. a very different uh, starting point, mm. which is why I want to buy a venue. Mm. Um, thank you. Thank you very much, everybody. I've got to run out the door to another talk. Thank, okay, can we give a big round of applause to our panel? Thank you very much, everybody. <laughs>